Hello again. Several people have mentioned the Samson option in comments here. In fact, a few people have simply commented Samson option with no other words attached to it, as though everybody would understand to what it referred and how important it was. So I thought it might interest viewers um, if I went into it for a little bit, as the origin of this awful policy is not widely known, perhaps. In the 1950s and early 1960s, when Britain, France, the United States and the Soviet Union were the only countries with nuclear weapons, two main strategies were considered for their use. One of these was counter-force, in which nuclear weapons would be used to um, strike each other's military targets, such as airfields, armoured columns, bases and so on. The other method was counter-city strikes, in which you lob hydrogen bombs at your enemy cities and hope this causes them to surrender. Britain didn't have enough nuclear weapons at that time, and I'm talking now in the 1950s, um, for them to be a serious player at nuclear war. They would soon run out, um, so they didn't. They couldn't really uh, play the Russians at counterforce. So they came up with a strategy which they thought would deter the Russians from ever attacking their country. This was known as the Moscow Option. Few people seem to have heard of the Moscow Option, which is mentioned in a briefing paper to which I provide a link in the description to this video. The Moscow option was brilliantly simple, although almost guaranteed to bring disasters to the entire world if ever used. The British decided that they didn't need masses of nuclear bombs. All they needed was to ensure that they could destroy Moscow. This is why Britain has for over 50 years always had a nuclear submarine on patrol, armed with missiles aimed at Moscow. Even when the Ivans had an anti-ballistic missile system protecting Moscow, the old Galosh missiles, uh, which have been retired now, the British made sure they could launch enough missiles to overwhelm that system and make sure that at least one would penetrate the defences and destroy Moscow. In this way, it was thought that the Russians would never attack or try to invade Britain because the price would be too high. It would mean the loss of their capital city. Of course, the drawback to this strategy for everybody was that if Moscow was to be taken out by a nuclear weapon, the Russians would then fire their weapons randomly all over Europe and probably at America too, not being sure uh, who had actually destroyed their city. It would be impossible for them to work out who had obliterated Moscow and they'd very likely treat any ally of Britain as being equally responsible. In other words... If Britain ever used the Moscow option, then it would almost certainly precipitate a worldwide nuclear war. The British knew this and felt pretty sure that this anxiety would stop anybody in Russia from harming Britain in the first place. Of course, the real purpose of this policy was to discourage American isolationism. If the Americans ever felt like withdrawing from Europe or abandoning Britain, then this would make them think twice. Even if they did pull out of Europe, Britain could still drag them into a thermonuclear war with Russia all by their own efforts. It was a form of nuclear blackmail, which forced America to do its best to ensure that Britain was never put in that position. One country in particular was enormously impressed by this dreadful scheme which effectively threatened the entire world with destruction just to keep Britain safe. Israel called their version of the Moscow option the Samson option. The reference is, of course, to Samson in the Bible. It will be recalled that he was captured by the Philistines, uh, blinded, had his hair cut, which uh, took his strength away, and kept prisoner for years. Of course, in the course of time, his hair grew back with it his strength, but the Philistines kind of forgot this. One day when they had a big festival, they brought Samson out to mock him. His strength may have left him when Delilah got somebody to cut his hair, but it had now returned. 
He pulled down the pillars of the building in which a feast was taking place, thus killing himself and his enemies at the same time. This ties in, of course, with what is sometimes um, called Israel's Metzada complex. I don't know if anyone's heard of this. At the fortress of Metzada near the Dead Sea, the Jewish defenders killed themselves and their families rather than be captured by the Romans who are besieging the place. It has been vowed that this will never happen again. There's a popular saying in Israel, Shenid Metzadala Tipol, which means Metzada shall not fall again. This ties in with the Samson option, because the hint is that if Israel ever felt that they were in the same position of the defenders of Metzada, they would make damn sure to take their enemies with them if they felt compelled to commit suicide a second time. The Israelis, as soon as they had their own nuclear weapons after 1967, worked hard to ensure that they could target Russian cities. Tashkent at first, um, they had enough um, power in their planes to make a one-way trip, a suicide mission, to get a nuclear weapon to Tashkent in the 1960s. And uh, they made it known to the Russians that they would definitely do this. Um, the reason for this was that the Russians were arming Syria and Egypt. There was a time in 1973 when it looked as though Israel might fall. And the Israelis made it very clear to the world that if the Russians encouraged other countries to destroy Israel, then they would pay the price in losing their own cities. Such a move, taking out Moscow, or, or indeed any other Russian city, would almost certainly end in a worldwide nuclear war, just as the British strategy would have had the same effect had they ever put the Moscow option into practice. I'm interested to see that the Samson option has become something which people tut about while shaking their heads disapprovingly. Those wretched, selfish Jews, they think, prepared to destroy the world in such a cavalier fashion. Typical. It's a very strange thing, because I have never, in the whole course of my life, ever heard anybody speak in this way of Britain's Moscow option. Oh, no. Why would the people ignore the British strategy but come down so heavily when Israel adopted it. I'm sure there's a word for that kind of thing when you ignore the bad things that other people are doing but only wake up and protest when you see Jews doing it. I wonder if anybody commenting here can remind me of what that elusive word is which I'm seeking. 